An Apology for Poetry, or The Defense of Poesy, is a work of literary criticism by Elizabethan poet Philip Sidney. It was written in approximately 1580 and first published in 1595, after his death. Sir Philip Sidney 30 November 1554 to the 17th of October 1586 was an English poet, courtier, scholar and soldier who is remembered as one of the most prominent figures of the Elizabethan age. His works include a sonnet sequence, Astrophel and Stella, a treatise, The Defense of Poesy, also known as The Defense of Poesy or An Apology for Poetry, and a pastoral romance, The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. Dot, dot. In An Apology for Poetry, Sir Philip Sidney sets out to restore poetry to its rightful place among the arts. Poetry has gotten a bad name in Elizabethan England, disrespected by many of Sidney's contemporaries. But, Sidney contends, critics of poetry do not understand what poetry really is, they have been misled by modern poetry, which is frequently bad. If one understands the true nature of poetry, one will see, as Sidney shows in his essay, that poetry is in fact the monarch of the arts. Sidney does so by articulating a theory of poetry, largely drawn from classical sources, as a tool for teaching virtue and the poet is a semi-divine figure capable of imagining a more perfect version of nature. Armed with this definition, Sidney proceeds to address the major criticisms made of the art of poetry and of the poets who practice it, refuting them with brilliant rhetorical skill. Following the seven-part structure of a classical oration, Sidney begins with an exordium, or introduction. He tells an anecdote about horse riding, noting that, like his riding instructor Giovanni Pietro Pugliano, he will not dwell so much on the writing of poetry as the contemplation and appreciation of it. Since he has become a poet, he feels obliged to say something to restore the reputation of his unelected vocation. Sidney begins his defense of poetry by noting that poetry was the first of the arts, coming before philosophy and history. Indeed, many of the famous classical philosophers and historians wrote in poetry, and even those who wrote in prose, like Plato and Herodotus, wrote poetically, that is, they used poetic style to come up with philosophical allegories, in the case of Plato, or to supply vivid historical details, in the case of Herodotus. Indeed, without borrowing from poetry, historians and philosophers would never have become popular, Sidney claims. 1 can get some indication of the respect in which poets were held in the ancient world by examining the names they were given in Latin and Greek, Vates and Poets. Vates means, seer, or, prophet, and in the classical world, poetry was considered to convey important knowledge about the future. Poets means maker, and this title reflects the fact that poets, like God, create new and more perfect realities using their imaginations. Sidney then moves to the proposition, where offers a definition of poetry as an art of imitation that teaches its audience through, delight, or pleasure. In its ability to embody ideas in compelling images, poetry is like, a speaking picture. Sidney then specifies that the kind of poetry he is interested in is not religious or philosophical, but rather that which is written by, right poets. This ideal form of poetry is not limited in its subject matter by what exists in nature, but instead creates perfect examples of virtue that, while maybe not real, is well suited to teaching readers about what it means to be good. Poetry is a more effective teacher of virtue than history or philosophy because, instead of being limited to the realm of abstract ideas, like philosophy, or to the realm of what has actually happened, like history, poetry can present perfect examples of virtue in a way best suited to instruct its readers. The poet can embody the philosopher's, wordish descriptions, of virtue in compelling characters or stories, which are more pleasurable to read and easier to understand and remember, like Aesop's fables. The poet should therefore be considered the, right popular philosopher, since with perfect and pleasurable examples of virtue, like Aeneas from Virgil's Aeneid, poetry can, move, readers to act virtuously. Reading poetry about virtue, Sidney writes, is like taking a, medicine of cherries. Following the classical structure from this examination to the refutation, Sidney rebuts the criticisms made of poetry by, poet-haters. Sidney outlines the four most serious charges against poetry, that poetry is a waste of time, that the poet is a liar, that poetry corrupts our morals, and that Plato banished poets from his ideal city in the Republic. He highlights that all of these objections rest on the power of poetry to move its audience, which means that they are actually reasons to praise poetry.
For if poetry is written well, it has enormous power to move its audience to virtue. Following a short peroration, or conclusion, in which he summarizes the arguments he has made, Sidney devotes the final portion of his essay to a digression on modern English poetry. There is relatively little modern English poetry of any quality, Sidney admits. However, is not because there is anything wrong with English or with poetry, but rather with the absurd way in which poets write poems and playwrights write plays. Poets must be educated to write more elegantly, borrowing from classical sources without abishly imitating them, as so many poets, orators, and scholars did in Sidney's time. For English is an expressive language with all the apparatus for good literature, and it is simply waiting for skillful writers to use it. Sidney brings an apology for poetry, to a close on this hopeful note, but not before warning readers that, just as poetry has the power to immortalize people in verse, so too does it have the power to condemn others to be forgotten by ignoring them altogether. The critics of poetry should therefore take Sidney's arguments seriously. It is generally believed that he was at least partly motivated by Stephen Gosson, a former playwright who dedicated his attack on the English stage, The School of Abuse, to Sidney in 1579, but Sidney primarily addresses more general objections to poetry, such as those of Plato. In his essay, Sidney integrates a number of classical and Italian precepts on fiction. The essence of his defense is that poetry, by combining the liveliness of history with the ethical focus of philosophy, is more effective than either history or philosophy in rousing its readers to virtue. The work also offers important comments on Edmund Spencer and the Elizabethan stage. Sidney states that there have been three general kinds of poetry, I the chief, being religious which imitate d the inconceivable excellencies of God, e philosophical and e imaginative poetry written by right poets who teach and delight. Philip Sidney's influence can be seen throughout the subsequent history of English literary criticism. One of the most important examples is in the work of the poet and critic Percy Bysshe Shelley. Shelley's modern argument for poetry is cast in a romantic strain in his critical work, A Defense of Poetry. In 1858, William Stigant, a Cambridge-educated translator, poet and essayist, writes in his essay, Sir Philip Sidney, that Shelley's beautifully written defense of poetry is a work which analyzes the very inner essence of poetry and the reason of its existence, its development from, an operation on, the mind of man. Shelley writes in defense that while, ethical science arranges the elements which poetry has created, and leads to a moral civil life, poetry acts in a way that, awakens and enlarges the mind itself by rendering it the receptacle of a thousand unapprehended combinations of thought. Sidney's influence on future critics and poets relates more closely to his view of the place of poets in society. Sidney describes poetry as creating a separate reality. The romantic notion, as seen in Wordsworth, is that poetry privileges perception, imagination and modes of understanding. Wordsworth seeks to go back to nature for moments recollected in tranquility. Sidney, like Shelley and Wordsworth, sees the poet as being separate from society. To Sidney the poet is not tied to any subjection. He saw art as equivalent to skill, a profession to be learned or developed, and nature is the objective, empirical world. The poet can invent, and thus, in effect grows another nature. Sidney writes that there is no art delivered to mankind that hath not the works of nature for his principal object. The poet then does not depart from external nature. His works are imitation, or fiction, made of the materials of nature, and are shaped by the artist's vision. This vision is one that demands the reader's awareness of the art of imitation created through the maker, the poet. Sidney's notion of for conceit means that a conception of the work must exist in the poet's mind before it is written. Free from the limitations of nature, and independent from nature, poetry is capable of making things either better than nature bringeth forth, or, quite anew, forms such as never were in nature. Sidney's doctrine presents the poet as creator. The poet's mediating role between two worlds transcendent forms and historical actuality corresponds to the Neoplatonic doctrine of emanation. A complement to this doctrine is the concept of return or catharsis, which finds a parallel in Sidney's contemplation of virtue, based on man's rational desire. Apology contains only elements of Neoplatonism without adhering to the full doctrine. Thirdly, Sidney implies a theory of metaphoric language in his work. 
A recurring motif in apology is painting or portraiture. Apology applies language used in a way suggestive of what is known in modern literary theory as semiotics. His central premise, as was that of Socrates in Plato's Republic, is that poetry is an art of imitation, that is, a, representing, counterfeiting, or figuring forth, not unlike a, speaking picture. Sidney pays his homage to Aristotle also. Yet he develops his own idea of metaphoric language, one that it is based on an analogy through universal correspondences. Sidney's humanist poetics and his tendency to harmonize disparate extremes to seek mediation find expression in poetic works by John Donne. The life and writings of Sir Philip Sidney remain a legacy. In 1819, Thomas Campbell concludes that Sidney's life was poetry in action, and then in 1858 William Stigand wrote that Sidney's real poem was his life, and his teaching was his example. Sidney, the man, is apparent everywhere in his works. A study of Sidney's works is a study of the man. An apology for poetry is one of the most important contributions to literary theory written in English during the Renaissance. Sidney advocates a place for poetry within the framework of an aristocratic state, while showing concern for both literary and national identity. Sidney responds in apology to an emerging antipathy to poetry as expressed in Stephen Gosson's The Shul of Abuse. Gosson offers what is in essence an attack on imaginative literature, Griffiths 5. What is at stake in Sidney's argument is a defense of poetry's nobility. The significance of the nobility of poetry is its power to move readers to virtuous action. True poets must teach and delight a view that dates back to Horace. In an era of antipathy to poetry and puritanical belief in the corruption engendered by literature, Sidney's defense was a significant contribution to the genre of literary criticism. It was England's first philosophical defense in which he describes poetry's ancient and indispensable place in society, its mimetic nature, and its ethical function. Among Sidney's gifts to his contemporaries were his respect for tradition and willingness to experiment. An example of the latter is his approach to Plato. He reconfigures Plato's argument against poets by saying poets are the least liar. Poets never claim to know the truth, nor make circles around your imagination, nor rely on authority. As an expression of a cultural attitude descending from Aristotle, Sidney, when stating that the poet, never affirmeth, makes the claim that all statements in literature are hypothetical or pseudo-statements. Sidney is a traditionalist, however, gives attention to drama in contradistinction to poetry. Drama, writes Sidney, is, observing neither rules of honest civility nor of skillful poetry, and thus cannot do justice to this genre. In Sidney's day anti-theatricality, an aesthetic and ideological concern, flourished among Sidney's circle at court. Theater became a contentious issue in part because of the culmination of a growing contempt for the values of the emergent consumer culture. An expanding money economy encouraged social mobility. Europe, at this time, had its first encounter with inflation. London's theaters at that time grew in popularity so much that by 1605, despite the introduction of charges, London commercial theaters could accommodate up to 8,000 men and women. Sidney had his own views on drama. In Apology, he shows opposition to the current of his day that pays little attention to unity of place in drama, but more specifically, his concern is with the manner that the matter is conveyed. He explains that tragedy is not bound to history or the narrative but to laws of poesy, having liberty, either to feign a quite new matter, or to frame the history to the most tragical conveniency. Sidney employs a number of strategies to assert the proper place of poetry. For instance, he argues against the way in which poetry was misaligned with youth, the effeminate and the timorous. He does so by introducing the idea that poetry is the companion of camps, and by Invoking the heroes of ages past. Sidney's reverence for the poet as soldier is significant because he himself was a soldier at one time. Poetry, in apology, becomes an art that requires the noble stirring of courage. Sidney writes an apology for poetry in the form of a judicial oration for the defense, and thus it is like a trial in structure. Crucial to his defense is the descriptive discourse and the idea that poetry creates a separate reality. Sidney employs forensic rhetoric as a tool to make the argument that poetry not only conveys a separate reality, but that it has a long and venerable history, and it does not lie. It is defensible in its own right as a means to move readers to virtuous action. Se 
censorship is one issue Sidney had to overcome through his use of rhetorical devices in the apology. Sidney was also versed in the phenomenon of courtiership. As part of his strategy against the threat of censorship, Sidney uses the structure of classical oration with its conventional divisions such as exordium and peroratio. Sidney's use of classical oration stems from his humanist education, Harvey won. He uses this method to build his argument, by making user of the rhetorical methods in such guides as Thomas Wilson's Arte of Rhetoric, 1553, Harvey II. Sidney also uses metaphor and allegory, to conceal and reveal his position. For instance, his use of horsemanship as imagery and analogy substantiates his vision of the transformational power of poetry. Sidney, as author, enters his work undetected in that the etymology of his name, Philip, is, horse lover, Pask 7. From the opening discourse on horsemanship, Sidney expands on the horse and saddle metaphor throughout his work by the, enlarging of a conceit, Leech 333. It is Sidney who then guards against a falling out with the, poet whippers, Leech 346. Sidney also attends to the rhetorical concept of memory. Poetry, apart from its ability to delight, has an affinity with memory, Leech 347. Method and style are thus key components of the apology to overcome the problem of censorship. For this reason, Sidney consciously defends fiction, and he attacks the privilege that is accorded to fact. He argues that the poet makes no literal claims of truth, is under no illusions, and thus creates statements that are in a sense, fictional, and as true as any others bear five. What is at stake then is not only the value of poetry in the sense of its utility, but also its place in a world replete with strife, the contingent and the provisional. Work cited. https colon slash slash www.litcharts.com slash lit slash and dash apology dash for dash poetry slash summary.